I'm going to time myself. I've been told I've strictly 45 minutes. So. <laughs> I always this shipwreck you can talk for hours about. So I will, I will try and stick to the timing. Um, yeah, first of all, just uh, thank you. Uh, much appreciation to Tan Bon Hui for inviting me to uh, to, to give this uh, presentation today. It's really an honor. Uh, it's always uh, it's always a great opportunity to to get to speak about this. Um, also to Dr. Adriana Prozer and her exhibitions team here at the Asian Civilized Art, here at Asian Society. Um, yeah, I came in about 10 days ago with the cargo and we, we spent the last, uh, uh, up until Friday evening working on installing it and it was a really great collaboration so I, I just wanted to acknowledge everybody here for, actually for making this so welcome as well. Um, okay, so tonight's talk, um, I, I think one thing that's, yeah, the significance of, of this shipwreck, I think sometimes the amount of stories and narratives and angles you can approach it from is, is maybe one of the most interesting aspects. And I'll touch on quite a few of them tonight. Um, you know, you, I, you could easily give a, a full lecture on how this shipwreck has influenced the history of Chinese ceramics. You could talk about how it's, it's changed our views of uh, Middle Eastern world and their ceramics and their traditions. Uh, its importance to Southeast Asia, Southeast Asian archaeology as well, is, is really fundamental. Um, and so many other aspects. Uh, the ship technology, um, even other issues that have arisen that are more controversial around um, maritime archaeology in general. All of these, I'll, you know, I'll touch on them tonight, but I thought for this lecture, I'd give a broad overview of, of the significance of this cargo, um, of this shipwreck. Um, and I think it's no, it's no exaggeration to say that it's really revolutionized our understanding of, um, of 9th century Asia. I, I start with this, um, this, this shipwreck scene. Um, this is actually by a contemporary Thai artist called um, Chilurm Chai. And uh, it illustrates one of the last Ten Jatakas, one of the last birth stories of the Buddha. Um, this is actually the Mahajanaka Jataka. And these, these stories began to be written down in about the 5th century AD, so about 400 years before the ship sailed, um, in Sri Lanka and, and in the Ther well, what would become the Theravada tradition. And what's very interesting is that even in these, these early um, Jataka tales, we get mention of shipwrecks and stories and, and sea trade. So again, you know, it's even before this shipwreck, it, it's already within the psyche of, of definitely the, the Buddhist world and, and the Indian Ocean world as well. And this particular scene is a shipwreck, obviously. Um, and the ship is sailing, is sailing with the, the Bodhisattva, the Buddha to be, and it runs into trouble and it sinks. And this is the, this is the bodhisattva here. And he climbs a mast and he, he jumps clear. So I just wanted to, it's a nice way, I think, to start the actual, um, this topic of shipwrecks. This is not, this is something that's been in, uh, in the psyche of, of, of the region for many, over a millennia. Okay. All right, there we go. So um, I refer to it as the Tang shipwreck tonight. It's also called the Bellatung shipwreck. So the, the terms are somewhat interchangeable. I thought I'd just overview first what's significant about it and some of the background. Just some of you are maybe not uh, as familiar. It was discovered in 1998 off Bellatung Island in the Java Sea, hence the, the term the Bellatung wreck. Um, yeah, it contained over um, 60,000 ceramics. They actually estimate the ship actually had about 70,000 ceramics on board. About 60,000 were recovered. Um, and they date to the, the Tang period. Um, quite, we can date it quite specifically. I'll talk about that in a moment. And it dates in and, in and around the mid 9th century. Um, where was it sailing from? Where was it sailing to? Um, we are pretty sure that it left from the Abbasid Caliphate. This is modern day Iran, Iraq, this re the region of the world. Um, and it went all the way to Tang period, China. It was on its return voyage that it sank. So we don't know what the outbound cargo is because they would have sold it upon their arrival. Um, but what we have is the return cargo. <clears throat> and really what has been quite revolutionary about this collection is that it's, 
Before this shipwreck was found, scholars knew that there was sea trade taking place, but they thought it was much more limited. Um, and most people or most scholars agreed that the main trade between uh, Central Asia, West Asia, and uh, China was over the much more familiar Silk Road, the land route, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. Um, but this shipwreck, it, the scale of the ceramics on board, you know, 60,000 of them, this really in a way turned things on, it, on its head and, and really showed that actually the shipping routes were just as important or perhaps even more important than the overland routes at this period. So this is one of the, I think, one of the really interesting um, points or discoveries that have come out. Yeah, how do we date it? Um, we have luckily a few different ways to do that, both scientific and stylistic and epigraphic. Out of the 50,000 or so Changsha bowls, um, these are the Changsha bowls. I'll talk about them more um, as we go along, and you'll see them in the exhibition. Out of the 50,000 of them, one had an inscription on it that dated it to 826 AD. Um, so obviously, we know the ship sailed after that date. Um, so yeah, very lucky. You can just about see it here. I think it's going to come up. There we go. So it's on the rim. It runs around the rim. So it's been read. Um, we also have coins on board. There was a number of coins found. Um, and uh, there was two different sets. Uh, one set dates to the 7th century. The other set dates to the 8th century. Um, so 200, 300 years earlier than, or 200 years earlier than the ship sailed. But this is not unusual. Uh, Chinese uh, coinage would stay in circulation for many centuries. So again, it gives us a date before which the ship could not have sailed. Um, the other main method was radiocarbon dating of wood samples, which again gave a date range of 6th to 9th century. And then uh, art historians um, started looking at the ceramics themselves and were able to tie it down to sort of mid-9th mid century. So there's a, a general consensus that this ship probably sailed in the 830s, 840s AD. Um, how do we know where the ship is from? This is one of the most interesting aspects of this discovery, again, is that it's actually most likely a Middle Eastern ship. Um, we know that because of the construction technique. There was not one single nail or dowel used in this ship. Um, instead, it was sewn together. Uh, the planks are actually sewn together. Um, probably we would see hibiscus. We're not quite sure exactly what the material is. And then it was... Uh, uh, packed in or wadded with lime and waterproofed again with lime. Um, and these are shipping techniques that are, are specific to the Persian Gulf, but also um, the west coast of India, so the Gujarat area. Um, so this is one way that scholars have been able to, to, to um, identify where the ship was from. This is a, a, a reconstruction of the, the actual sewing technique. If you go up to the, the exhibition, you'll see the the Jewel of Muscat, which was a reconstruction, a ship that was re reconstructed uh, in 2010 based on this information that was recovered um, by the uh, excavations and, and the salvage, um, mixed and also with ethnographic um, evidence from Oman. Oman is the last place where this uh, tradition still survives today. Um, also, what's interesting is the scientific analysis shows that some of the wood that was used for this ship actually comes from the uh, east coast of Africa. So even at this point, we have wood from Africa being shipped um, up to the mid Middle East and then the ship being constructed. Um, interestingly, it also showed that repairs were probably done in wood in Southeast Asia. Um, this is the Jewel of Muscat. Yeah, it's, if you go upstairs, there's a nice um, display of, of the actual construction of this ship. So it'll give you a, a good understanding of, of that method. There's also a National Geographic um, documentary on it that I really recommend watching. It's, it's fascinating. The ship actually sailed from Oman all the way to Singapore um, in 2010. So it's, again, to, uh, sort of experimental archaeology, so it's really quite fascinating. Um, one thing that's interesting about the, the ship itself, um, we know where it, it was made, but there's a question, of course, is uh, who was the crew? Um, and there was, at this period, the Persians and the Arabs were really uh, controlling the, the trade networks in the Indian Ocean world, uh, even all the way to um, 
to China. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, but some of the evidence, some of the, uh, the material recovered uh, also gives us some clues. Um, this object here is an ink stone. Uh, you can see this sort of looks like a cicada on top. Um, so this probably belonged to a, a Chinese merchant, maybe somebody involved with the cargo who was on board to oversee it. This is a Chinese lacquer plate. Um, interestingly, of the whole cargo, only four pieces of, of clear Middle Eastern wear um, were on board, which, again, is not unusual because the outbound cargo would have been sold, and this is the return cargo. But these um, turquoise earthenware ceramics, they're very characteristic of, of mid the Middle East. And we know quite specifically where the kilns are. They're in, around modern-day Basra in what is today Iraq. Um, so these were, were actually recovered from the ship. And glass. Glass is a very good indicator of uh, the Middle Eastern influence. The, the Chinese at this period, period did not have um, sophisticated glass technology. Um, so when we find glass of this quality, it's a, it's a good signifier that it's actually Middle Eastern. Um, the other story is the Southeast Asians. Um, the ship obviously sank in Southeast Asia. It most likely docked in Southeast Asian ports along the way. And there's some material on the ship as well that shows that. Um, these are some, um, these are canarium seeds which you can pickle. Um, so very useful for uh, long sea voyages. Um, this is a Sumatran mirror. Sumatra is in present-day Indonesia. And these gold coins, these Pilonchito coins, are, are also a characteristic of, in, of, of what is today Indonesia. At that time, it would have been the, the culture of Srivijaya. So we see, again, evidence. We can speculate that there was a sort of multi-ethnic crew, definitely. There would be attrition of crew along the way, and they would have to pick up crew members as they went along. Also, Southeast Asians would have probably acted as pilots in, in, along certain parts of the journey. Um, the recovery, I'm not going to talk about it too much. We had a, a, a symposium on Saturday about it, and there's a lot of information in the gallery uh, that deals with it. But there is a certain amount of controversy, uh, some of you may be aware of. Um, the, the wreck lay in shallow water about 18 meters or less, or 18 meters of water. Um, and it was very vulnerable to looting and ac accidental destruction. So the Indonesian government uh, granted a salvage license to a, a German company. Um, and over two seasons, they recovered um, the bulk of the cargo. Um, the issue here, though, is that you know, there's a commercial interest here. And um, it wasn't done as painstakingly or slowly as an uh, archaeological excavation would have. So certain information was probably lost in terms of documentation and so forth. Um, but the reality in 1998, 1999 in Indonesia was that if this had not been salvaged uh, quickly, it would have been looted. It was already being looted um, before the salvage company got there and even during um, the salvage operation. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky question, but um, one that there's no easy answers to. Uh, the objects were then conserved for a period of about two to four years or, um, in New Zealand. This is some of the, uh, it's a selection of the pieces that we have. Um, but what's really interesting is the cargo. Um, it's, as I said, there were 60,000 or so ceramics on this vessel. Um, the bulk of them are Changsha wares. These are a, a, wear from, a, a, a wear that is mainly um, made for export. And the, they are not particularly found in China. This is um, an everyday use in China. So quite interesting. But there was also some very high value wares as well, uh, green wares, the UA wares, white wares. Um, that would have been highly valued in China. These were not export wares. So there's a mixed cargo. You have a sort of low value or mid value uh, bulk cargo. And then you have some very expensive high end uh, ceramic as well. Um, and then there was also some very precious items on there, uh, gold and silver, some of which is in the exhibition you can have a look at. Um, there were spices found as well, star anise, which is from um, southern China and uh, uh, northern Vietnam. And then we can speculate that they, they, 
that there was textiles on board, perhaps silk, um, but of course, uh, textile is not going to survive underwater, so we have no actual direct evidence uh, that there was silk on board. But it, it's such a high value cargo and in such a high demand within um, uh, the Middle East that there was probably silk on board stored on the deck, um, maybe in bales, but that's just a question mark. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, one good question is how do you get you know, 70,000 bowls onto an 80-meter long ship? It's quite, a, it's quite an achievement of um, modern uh, or ancient packing. And, and how they did it um, was they had these larger storage jars, these Guangdong storage jars. Again, there's, there's two of them in the show. Um, and they would pack the Changsha bowls in these sort of helix uh, coils inside. And you could get about 130, 140 in each, um, in, each bowl, in each larger jar. And then they would probably pack them with an organic material like straw to, to cushion them. Um, and this explains how they were able to get so many, uh, such a large cargo. The whole bow of, or the whole sort of bulk of the ship would have been completely full of these uh, storage jars. Um, so the crew would have had to live on deck the whole time. Um, it also explains why a, a lot of the ceramic you will see upstairs when you have a look at the show is in such good condition because it was projected from the elements, protected from the sea within these large, larger um, storage jars. So a lot of the Changsha wares still have their glaze uh, pretty much intact. Um, and it's interesting then some of them the glaze has worn off would have been more exposed to the sea so we can see different levels of conservation. Okay, I'll talk a bit about the route, because this is, I think, where, one of the most interesting aspects. All right. Um, so this is the Abbasid Empire of what is today predominantly Iran, Iraq, um, parts of Saudi Arabia. Um, the main port is here, this is Basra, and the other main port was Siraf at the time. The capital, Baghdad, was actually founded in 751 uh, AD, and it was the capital at this period. But at the time of sailing, the capital had probably shifted to Samara. This became the capital for a brief period before it moved back to Baghdad. Um, so we think on the outbound journey, the ship probably originated somewhere in the Persian Gulf. It would have hugged the coast, gone all the way around the tip of India. Kalam here is a major port. Um, we know in the ninth century, uh, we have a copper plate inscriptions that give a very clear description of the market at this time. There was a market there that um, is very interesting because it, while the king himself was Hindu, the market um, had Nestorian Christians, Jews, Arabs, and Persians all trading in this, this marketplace. So again, we start to see these cosmopolitan ports uh, forming even at this period. And it's ports like these that are controlling these trade networks and explain how it's possible to uh, ship um, such a large amount of cargo between two, you know, very wide, dis uh, large areas or distances. So this is one of the major ports. Um, it may have gone up to Tamra Lipti. This is very near Monday, Calcutta. This is another major port um, and hugged the coast down. Or if it timed the monsoon correctly, it could shoot right across um, the Bay of Bengal. Uh, from here, it would have gone down the Straits of Malacca. It would have gone around the tip of what is now Singapore. And it could have then either hugged the coast again or, or taken a slightly more direct route up the coast. It most likely would have had to stop at Guangzhou, which is just uh, near modern-day Hong Kong. Um, by this period, the Chinese actually had a customs inspector in, Guang, in Guangzhou. So all uh, ships, international ships, had to dock at this port and basically pay, pay an exercise or import tax or customs tax. So this is sort of customs clearance and immigration. Um, and then there's a, there's a debate as to where the cargo was, was actually, the sh whether the ship stopped at Guangzhou or whether it went all the way up to Yangzhou. Um, Yangzhou was the major commercial center at this period, and it's most likely that the cargo was assembled here. So it probably then went further up the coast and docked here. Um, the argument for, for it not going up here is that it would then be able to return the same year, it would be able to catch the, the monsoon back. 
um, and be able to do the, the journey in, in about a year. If it goes up to Yangzhou, it will miss the return monsoon and have to stay a year. So the, the, the journey becomes a two-year voyage, um, which would not really be problematic, as I'll show in a moment. There was actually large Arab communities in these, in these areas. Um, what happens next after it picks up its cargo is that it starts to return back. Um, and it probably retraces its steps to about here. This is where it gets interesting and, and somewhat confusing. Um, it sinks here. So if it was going directly back to the Middle East, there's no reason for it to be going um, down to uh, which is Palembang and Java. Um, so it was probably either going to dock in Palembang or in Salendra. These are uh, the kingdom of Srivijaya at that po point. And the reason for that, it was, it was probably after spices. These are the spice islands just, just here, which is the only source of cloves, nutmeg, um, and uh, mace right up until the 19th century. And these were highly sought after in uh, the Middle East. So I, I tend to think that it was probably coming down here to do a bit of uh, trading for spices, and then it would have made its journey back. So that's, that's the route as far as we can ascertain. Um, there is some debate, again, as to whether the ship makes a, a direct route um, all in one, or some scholars feel that it would have been transshipment, that the ship would not have done the whole voyage. It would have done part of the voyage and then handed the cargo on to another ship that would have done the next leg and, and so forth, or that the cargo would have been sold along the way. Um, so these are the sort of two competing ideas at the moment. Yeah, just a quick... Uh, discussion. One of the things I think that's really driving this trade at this period is that you have, on either end of it, you have these two very powerful empires. These are golden ages, really, in, in Tang China, but also in the, in the uh, Islamic world, the Abbasid Empire becomes really this, this uh, center of learning and culture um, for many, many millennia. Uh, this is the great mosque at Samara. Um, and this is a, a University of Baghdad. It's, it's later, but the 13th century, but it still shows the uh, level of uh, education that is there at this period. And this is actually the, the, one of the interesting things of this period, and we see it with the Tang shipwreck. I'll talk about it a bit in a moment. This, we, you see a lot of uh, transfer of technology and uh, uh, culture and so forth. And at this period, the Abbasids um, obtain paper technology from the Chinese. And this is quite a watershed, because then they start to translate a lot of um, uh, literature and philosophy and, and put it down on, and preserve it. And one of the most famous uh, uh, philosophers that they translated in this period is Aristotle. So uh, if the, the Islamic world had not translated and recorded Aristotle, it would have been lost to us. So this is you know, just to emphasize again that there's you know, a lot of um, connections and tri uh, going back and forth here between cultures. So it's, it's really quite a, a key moment. Um, Tang China as well, this is a real high point in Chinese culture. You have a flourishing of, of literature, uh, literature and culture and, uh, and so forth. Uh, it's also when the, there's a sort of booming trade, a lot of it inspired by the overland Silk Route, and this is, of course, the capital, uh, Xi'an, or ancient Chang'an. Um, the overland route would have been mainly done by camel, and you, of course you start to see a lot of these uh, um, uh, ceramics of, of camels and so forth um, at this period. All right, oops. Yeah, and interestingly, and, and actually quite importantly, it's, you know, if you're going to engage in this complicated and quite sophisticated trade networks. You need merchants and you need agents along the way. And, and we know that Arabs and Persians were in um, China from very early on, from about the 7th, 8th century. This is the earliest mosque in Guangdong. Um, it's traditionally dated to 627 AD. That's probably a bit too early. It was said to be founded by Muhammad's uncle. But it's definitely there by the 8th, 9th century. Um, this is the great mosque in Dian. It's this dates to the Ming period, but it is built on top of a Tang period mosque. So we, we have these Arab and per Persian communities within um, Tang China at this period, and they're really the ones you know, facilitating this, this trade. All right, But we do have evidence, I'll go through this quite quickly, um, 
before, even earlier, of, of trade um, between uh, uh, at least India and China. And this is, you know, we are, this is recorded by Buddhist monks. So even in the fifth century, we have trade routes such as this. Um, these are the routes. We know from there, they left travelogues. Um, this is another very important one for us that talks about sea trade between uh, South Asia and um, the cent oh, I'm sorry, Southeast Asia. We have an inscription dating to the 5th, 6th century that uh, tells of the great sea captain Buddhagupta in all respects, be they successful in their voyage. So this is a ship that's actually not sunk. It's actually made a successful journey. And they've dedicated this inscription here in, in Southeast Asia. So again, just more evidence. One of the best um, accounts of, 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 um, of a sea voyage is Yi Jing. He's a very famous um, Buddhist monk who left for Srivijaya and then on to, on to India to um, basically to study the scriptures and so forth. And he, very interestingly, he says that he takes a Persian ship um, on, his joy, on his voyage. So this is about 150 years before the Tang shipwreck. And he starts out in Guangdo, Guangdong, sorry. He goes down to Srivijaya, and it's here in Srivijaya that he actually learns Sanskrit. So he stays here for about six months, and then he continues up the coast to, to this very famous site, Kedah, Bujang Valley. Uh, he, he changes onto another ship here, and he goes on up to Tamarlipti in uh, very near modern day uh, Calcutta. So again, very clear indications that these trade routes were in operation for you know, a good three, 400 years before. Ah, sorry. And that's actually where the, the tank shipwreck sank. Um, recently, there's been more evidence from shipwrecks that have, that have come to light in um, Southeast Asia. So very interesting. It's sort of filling in the story more of, um, of the 8th, 9th, 10th century. This is the tank, the Bellatung, the tank shipwreck here. But there's been another one recently, the Cherubon shipwreck. This is 150 years later. Uh, this is an even larger cargo of over 200,000 ceramics. So again, we see that this trade continues and actually escalates and, and gets um, even more intense as, the, as we enter the Song period. Um, this is an interesting one that's been discovered in Thailand very recently. It's very close to Bangkok. And again, this one's interesting because it's actually a sewn ship as well. So the same technology as the tank shipwreck, so most likely a Middle Eastern vessel. And we also know of one, uh, my, there we go, um, that's been discovered in the co coast of Vietnam as well. So we're, getting, we're beginning to build up more of a picture as well of these shipwrecks and the the, the trade not just within Southeast Asia, but internationally. So I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd share you with that. OK. Um, I'll talk now a bit about the actual ceramics and the cargo themselves and why they're, they're significant. Um, the main bulk, as I said, is these Changsha kilns, uh, Changsha wares. Most of them are these bowls. They're about uh, 15 centimeters in diameter. They're very uniform in shape. Uh, they're, they're polychromes. They have this. Um, Iron glaze, iron, and the, the, the green is done with copper, copper glaze. And they're, they're very interesting because they, they look like the, the Chinese kilns, these kiln sites, are actually marketing their product for the, the Middle Eastern world. They're adapting Chinese motifs and so forth um, to the Middle Eastern market. So again, when we, we look at this exchange, it's not just chance. It's, you know, it's, it's actually quite well organized. This motif is quite Chinese, you know, it's a sort of a cloud motif. But these brown um, marks around the edge, some people say they actually refer to Islamic designs that you see on glass. Um, as I said, about 57,000 pieces were recovered. And they were really a testament to sort of mass production and the, the ability of these kilns in, in China to mass produce ceramic at this time. So this is another very interesting aspect that we have a kiln site that's really um, technologically very advanced and able to, to tailor a cargo of this scale. Um, it's quite remarkable. Okay, yeah, I just, just, yeah. They're characterized by this quite free-flowing brushwork on them. They, they're quite uniform, but you can, if you start to look at enough of them, you can begin to distinguish different 
patterns, and some, some of them are better than others. You'll see in the gallery that some of them are, you know, some of the bird motifs are a little bit wonky and funny, so it's kind of fun. Um, and some of them are really beautiful. So there's, you know, there's this sort of mixed quality to them as well. Um, I show you this one because it's very interesting. This, it looks like our, our big calligraphy, but it's not, uh, it doesn't mean anything. So this seems to be the Chinese potters sort of imitating um, Arabic style, but it can also all, sort of look like a Chinese landscape. So there's this play going back and forth as well of motifs. Um, so, the, so this is what we start to see on these, on these pieces. Um, Some of them have these uh, kind of quite uh, interesting, sort of scary sea monsters on them. One in the collection actually has a face of a foreigner. It looks like a perhaps an um, Arab, a Middle Eastern man. You can see the curly hair. So we can speculate that perhaps he visited the kiln site to place his order, and the, the Chinese potters were like, wow, oh my god. And they like, started noodling, and it was like noodling on the, uh, on the bowl. So yeah, very interesting. And of course, at this period, Buddhism is really flourishing in Tang China. This is the high point of Buddhism. It's when it really takes off. And this is a pagoda, you can see here quite clearly, and the the swastika motifs and the flag. So again, we have certain um, motifs we can identify. Um, some of them are inscriptions as well. A lot of them have been read. I won't go through them. But it's, it's interesting as well, because if these are being sent to the Middle Eastern world, uh, you know, they probably couldn't read the inscriptions on them, but maybe they were kind of exotic. or you know. So it's, again, interesting. Um, we also get these ewers. This ewer form is quite popular in the cargo as well. We have some of them on, on show up, upstairs. And again, if you look here, this motif, it almost looks like a fig or a pomegranate. It's, it's sort of a Middle Eastern style. It's not something you'd usually associate with Chinese um, motifs and the, the bow here. So again, we see, even though they're produced in China, we see this, this tailoring to a, a Middle Eastern market. Um, they also produce their greenware as a sort of low quality of greenware. We have one or two on display. And some whimsical forms as well. This is a little dog. It looks, it's tiny. It's, you know, it's about four centimeters. And we have a whistle, a, a bird in the shape of a whistle as well. So some sort of idiosyncratic pieces. OK. Oh, yeah. OK. Um, that's the bulk cargo. That's you know, the, the material that that's clearly seems to be made for export. But interestingly, there's also a high-value cargo on here as well, but in much less quantity. Um, and we have about 200 uh, of, these, of the greenware celadons, the UA wares. And these are, these are not made for export. These are made for the Chinese market. This is the type of ceramic that, if you're a well-to-do Chinese at this period, this is what you would, you would, uh, you would aspire to. Um, they were compared to jade, so if you couldn't afford jade, you could get UA celadon. This was the sort of next best thing. Um, the other reason they became popular was at this period, um, tea drinking became very in vogue. This is when you start to really get the, the tea drinking culture in China. Um, and there's a, a, a famous uh, poet who says that it's much more preferable to drink green tea out of a green uh, ceramic because it enhances the color. And so he strongly advises you do this, uh, whereas others will say that the whiteware, it makes the T2 sort of cinnamon looking. So these, we know, you know there's a lot of um, literary references to these type of ceramics as well. So these would have been extremely highly prized, not just in, in China, but of course, if they reached the Middle East, these really would be quite prestigious wares to, to have. This one is quite unique. It's a double fish, a sort of double carp. And it's the only example we know anywhere. Where there's no extant examples in China of this type. So again, very interesting. Um, whitewares, I think if you know Chinese ceramics, this is one thing that everybody thinks about Chinese porcelain and the sort of purity of that white clay that they were able to achieve. Um, so again, there was about 200 whitewares on board. And we know from um, Arab, Arab writers in the 9th, 10th century, they, these were really highly valued. They sort of described them like pearl cups that shined like the moon. So they were very sought after. This, again, is very high-end wares. Um, and the, what we begin to see is the Middle Eastern uh, kilns and potters trying to imitate the Chinese whiteware, but they're not quite successful because they don't have the clay. They don't have the white clay to, to really get that 
beautiful translucent body, so they use a slip. Um, so this is one thing we see. I, I think I have an example. Yeah. Okay. So this is not from the shipwreck. This is a Chun Abbasid uh, whiteware, and you can see this is the this is one from the shipwreck. Actually, it's in the exhibition upstairs. Um, and you can see the, the play back and forth, this lobed feature. Um, the lobed feature is actually a Sasanian motif first, and it moves into China. Um, but they've used a slip to try and you know, em emulate the whiteness of a, of a Chinese vase. Um, the green splash, we have, quite, we have a few of these on display upstairs as well, the Ewer being probably the main highlight. These are very, very interesting pieces um, that when they were first discovered in the Middle East uh, in excavations in the 1930s and even up to the 80s, um, a lot of scholars actually didn't realize they were even Chinese. They thought they were Middle Eastern. That's how um, uh, sort of un-Chinese people you know, thought these were. Um, and again, you don't really see them at all in China. Um, we don't really find them. We only find them at the ports you know, where they were probably being exported. We don't find them in... In, um, in burials and this period and so forth. But what's interesting is this kiln site, Gongxian, is where you get the Sansai glaze wear as well. So it seems like this kiln site has actually started, as well as making the tomb pottery, the, the three glaze type. Um, they've also sort of branched out into this greenware for the export market. It's really, it's really beautiful stuff. It's, it's quite contemporary in its feel as well, I find. Uh, this is really one of the, the highlights of the whole show. I'm sure you've all seen it on the publicity and so forth. Um, it's this monumental ewer. Uh, it probably was not functional. It's too large to actually have been used um, as an actual ewer to pour water. The, the handle would have probably snapped if you tried to do it. And it's based on metal prototypes that would have been smaller, that would have been used. Um, and again, what's very interesting on this is we start to see one thing that's characteristic in this uh, shipwreck is a hybridity or a, a fusing of, of motifs. So if you look here, this lozenge motif with the floral decorations, this is a very much a, a Middle Eastern uh, Iranian motif. Um, so you see it, the, the Chinese potters have incised it into this ware. But along the top, you have the Chinese uh, cloud scrolls. So you get the... You know, you get the the Chinese motif and the Middle Eastern motif all wrapped up in one object. So again, this is really encapsulate that, that fusion of, of um, design. And this is a very clear example. Again, this is not from the shipwreck. This is actually from the, uh, the Kuwait, Kuwait National Museum. And it really emphasizes how close in style these, these uh, ceramics are. So there's a real play back and forth here between the, the Chinese and the, the Middle Eastern potters. Um, it's, again, one of these open questions as to who came up with the green splash style first. It may have actually been the, the Middle Eastern potters and the Chinese picked up on it, realizing that this was a, a marketable product back. Um, that actually brings us on to three of the sort of most remarkable pieces that were discovered on the shipwreck. There are these three pieces of blue and white. Um, this really surprised scholars um, when they were discovered. People usually associate Chinese blue and white ware with the Yuan dynasty starting in the 14th century. Um, that's when it really, you know, you get that classical uh, Chinese porcelain. But here we have very early examples of blue and white. But what's interesting is, again, the motif is more of a Middle Eastern motif. It's this lozenge motif again. Um, okay. This is another one from the shipwreck. This is what they're imitating. This is a, an example. This, again, is not from the shipwreck. This is from um, the Abbasid world. So you can see the sort of lozenge motif. And what's interesting, and these sort of really encapsulate this idea of a globalized world in the ninth century, because um, to get the blue, you need cobalt. And uh, at this period, cobalt is only available, the mineral is only available in the Middle East. So it was obviously being shipped out to China the Chinese potters had the, the white clay. They had the better white clay. So they produced this ware, this blue and white ware, and then they shipped it back to the Middle East, or they intended to ship it back to the Middle East. So you, you, know, you see this movement not only of, go, of trade and ideas and, and people, but also raw material and product. So a very, very interesting movement back and forth. For some reason, this tradition, this, it, doesn't really, it definitely doesn't take off in China because we don't, really find 
this type of blue and white ware from the 9th, 10th, 11th century. Um, so these may have been samples you know, that they were sent. As I said, there was only three on the shipwreck. Um, okay. Yeah, and these are just two quick examples. This is the uh, lozenge motif again. So we see an artistic exchange back and forth through the ceramics. Um, also very significant uh, was the gold and silver that was found on the, on the vessel. There's only seven gold pieces found, but very high value cargo, of very high quality workmanship. Um, and we're pretty sure at this period in the eighth, sorry, the ninth century, the workshops for this type of gold were, were in Yangzhou, um, the main commercial port at that period. And again, what's very interesting with the gold is, is actually there's, and silver, there's a sort of longer story of exchange back and forth. Gold in China was not really valued until about the 6th, 7th, 8th, 7th century onwards. And this type of gold working te technique was actually brought into China by the Sasanians. It came along the Silk Road. The Sasanians are the Persian culture that preceded the, the um, Abbasids. Um, but the Chinese really begin to take up gold working in the 7th, 8th century. And by the 9th century, they, they pretty much made it their own. So here we have, again, you know, sort of um, this metal working technique coming in from the Middle East, the Chinese adapting it and, and um, really developing their own style with it. And then, you know, shipping it back. So it's very interesting. We have this constant back and forth. Again, this gold plate, it has the Buddhist motif of the swastika on it. And this, another very beautiful example. Um, we have two with these mandarin ducks, this very Chinese motif. Again, you can see the quality of the workmanship. It's uh, incision work, but also repasse and punching technique on, on the dishes. And then with the cup, we have a gold cup. It's really very interesting. It's an octagonal cup, one of the largest ever found. Um, and it's eight-sided eight octagonal, as I said. Um, what, what's interesting is the motifs again, the, the hand... This, this is here, this is the handle, this is a, a shot of it. And there's these bearded men, it looked very uh, Central Asian. Um, the dancer figures on the, uh, on the sides, again, they're, dan they're attired in, in Central Asian dress. And we know at this period that a lot of the court entertainment was done by Central Asians. So again, we see these, the, in the cosmopolitan nature of, of the Tang uh, society at this period. Yeah, and then here's some of the silver. We have two of the boxes on display. Um, this is one of my favorites. It's a little rhino um, in the center of this bowl. And you can, so again, you can see the, the, the technique. It's an incision or a chasing technique. And then a, a repose when they're hammering from the back. It's, it's kind of cute. Um, rhinos were actually indigenous to um, southern China, apparently in this period and, and Southeast Asia. So the artists may actually be familiar with what a rhino actually looks like. Oh, can I get the next slide? It's, it's, it's the, all right, there we go. Yeah, some, what's also interesting with um, Chinese ceramic is that it, it imitates or it plays off metal forms. And we have this example is actually in the show as well, and so is this incense burner. And they're sort of very similar to the ceramics you see. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that briefly, but um, I won't really go into it in much depth. Another very interesting thing is the mirrors that were on board. Um, there was 29 of them. Um, but some of them were actually already antiques in antiquity. One, this one here is actually a hand period mirror, so it dates to the uh, second century BC to the first century AD. So very interesting whether or not the Persian Arab merchants knew that they were buying an antique or not. It's, it's, a, it's an open question. Um, this mirror, though, is very interesting, very significant. Again, it's one of these um, things that revolutionized our understanding of, of, of um, this period. Until this was found, they were only known in lit literary references, and some people didn't even believe that they may have existed. They're called a heart of the Yangtze River mirror, and they're meant to have been forged on, on a barge on the river, on the Yangtze River, um, just after the summer solstice or the winter solstice. And they're, they're Taoist mirrors. You can see the, the hexagrams and the, the four mythical Taoist animals. And they were meant to capture the yin or the yang energy as you forge them. 
Um, and this one's dated to uh, 759, so again, it's, it would have been 80 years old at the time. So again, it's very interesting if this has been shipped to the Middle East, would they understand these concepts or would they, you know, would they get the spiritual significance? So it's an interesting question. But this is also very important in terms of um, it confirms what we know from literary sources. Um, yeah, I talked a, a lot about the storage jars. This is how they shipped everything. Um, interesting, they have these marks on them. Not all of them, but a lot of them. That are not, no one's able to read them, but they seem like they might be sort of merchant marks so people know what part of the cargo belongs to, to their own. It may have been a consignment cargo. Uh, the two examples we have on display at this show have, have these inscriptions, so go take, you can go take a look. Yeah, and then just briefly as well, because I'm sort of running short on time. Um, you know, what were they used for? It's a really interesting question. Um, a lot of it in China, they would have been used for tea. They were tea bowls. This actually says uh, tea bowl, if you can read it. Um, uh, so very interesting. But uh, of course, yeah, and this is, a, this is a ewer, so you would heat the water, um, and then you would rinse the bowls. And this is a slop jar, so this is how you would, you would dispose of the water. Um, and tea at this time was actually not in leaf. It was more similar to what the matcha tea, the Japanese matcha tea, the powdered tea. So that's how they would have drank it at that period. And they would have added spices and salts and stuff that were probably contained in, in these uh, containers. But they, it, so it's an interesting question with all these Changsha bowls and these wares going to the Middle East. You know, they weren't drinking tea at that period, as far as we know. Um, you know. So what would they have used them for? Would they have used them for similar purposes or not? So again, you know, the, the form and the object moves, but the, the usage may, have, may change in different cultures. So again, it's, it's one of these interesting aspects. Uh, the kilns, you can, they, they're from a, a variety of different regions in, um, in China. So again, it, the coordination that would have had to take place to um, to amass this cargo, again, it speaks to the level of organization at that period. And this is when we have the Grand Canal has been built. It's this um, uh, a canal system that linked up a lot of the rivers, that, that linked up a lot of these major cities, and, and actually allowed for this type of transshipment to take place. And really quickly, um, sometimes when I give this talk, I focus, if I'm in Southeast Asia, I, I, I really look at the Southeast Asian aspect. I haven't really spoken about it tonight, but it's another very important part of the story. Um, these are the major cultures in the 7th, 8th, 9th century. And the ship would have stopped along the way at these cultures. Um, some scholars argue the ship was, was bound for uh, Southeast Asia, and may have, that may have been its final port of call. Um, at these, these different sites, I'm highlighting what's interesting is we find um, Changsha ware, we find Yue wares, we find the turquoise um, Persian ware as well. So we know that, that these ceramics were being traded at these ports, and um, particularly here in, in the peninsula of Thailand, uh, or what is today the Thai Malay Peninsula, um, these are the main ports on... Oops, my, can you click it forward? Thanks. The animation. There we go. And there's one more. Uh, okay. These are three main ports that the Thai archaeologists have surveyed. Um, and the ceramics, they literally turn up on the, on the beach. Um, there's so many of them. This is the site of Lempo. So this is one, uh, this is a Changsha bowl. This is a fragment of a Changsha bowl. So again, we can track the, um, we can track the nature of trade or where trade is taking place with China through these ceramics. So they're very important from that aspect as well. Um, one of the most important sites is Kedah, the Bujang Valley. It's now in what is modern-day northern Malaysia. And this is a very significant entrepot. And the ship, there's a very strong possibility that the, the, the ship uh, docked here at, at one period in its journey. Um, it's occupied from about the 3rd to the 14th century. Uh, there's a, a major Buddhist and Hindu remains at this site. Um, it was, they sent missions to the Sui dynasty even in the 7th century, it was known about. Um, yeah, and this Yi Jing actually transferred on a ship here. Um, 9th century Arab texts refer to a place called uh, Kala Kataha, which we think is actually this port. Um, and again, this is some of the 
objects that have been excavated there, these, this, these are from the Tang shipwreck, but this is a Tang mirror that's been excavated at this site. This is a vase, which is later, the 12th century, but again, it speaks to that contact. And then this is this Persian ware that I start, showed you right at the start, the, the turquoise Persian ware. You can also get it in a greenish form. So again, this begins to build up a larger picture of, well, of, of where the ship would have stopped off in Southeast Asia. And just to finish, um, the two main cultures at that time in Southeast Asia in the 7th, 8th, 9th century was, is known as Srivijaya. And this was a maritime culture. It, it pretty much controlled um, the Straits of Malacca and, and some parts of the South China Sea here. Um, and it was a very rich and uh, sophisticated Buddhist culture. Um, and also Java, um, where you have today Borobudur. So, yeah, this is Java. This is Borobudur. This was built in the 9th century, probably if 20 or 30, 40 years before the tank ship exhaled. So very sophisticated cultures as well. Um, and again, we found, archaeologists have found these types of wares in this, um, here we go, in this area. And we have a very famous depiction of a ship. This is a Southeast Asian style of ship. So again, more evidence for shipping and trade at this period. And just to finish, this, this is the, uh, the Indonesian archaeologists have found you know, these large-scale Persian um, ceramics in central Java. And when you usually find the Persian wares, you also find the Chinese wares. And these are these storage jars that I've been talking about, uh, where they wrap the Changsha bowls in. These ones are in a museum in Leeward and the Princesshof in, in the Netherlands at the moment. And they were excavated in the early, 19th, early 20th century um, and collected by a Dutch, um, a Dutch collector. And again, so again, evidence, you know, there's 20 of them in the collection. So very clear evidence of trade going back and forth between Java, uh, Srivijaya, and, and, uh, and China. So just to close, yeah, I mean, it really is a, I think, Bunhui has said it, and, and we've sort of said a lot in our, every time I give a tour, I always say as well, the, the, the shipwreck really is a snapshot of, of, you know, globalized Asia, globalized world in the ninth century. And this is really, I think, the sort of, maybe the most fascinating aspect of it. Um, it really fills in our, our knowledge of, of trade routes and how extensive they, they are. In terms of the ceramics, the sheer mass production uh, really speaks to the technological uh, ability of China at this time and, and the, the tailoring to foreign markets. Um, and it's important to remember that this is just one of many. I mean, this is one that sank, so we know about it. Um, but there would have been other ships that were plying this route. How many ceramics or what their cargoes were, we can only speculate. And just really to finish, I started with this Buddhist tale, um, and I'll finish with a somewhat happy ending. Um, people ask, one of the questions is, did, did they find any uh, human remains on board the ship when it sank? Did the crew survive? The archaeologists, they found no evidence of human remains. Um, it was in shallow waters. It may be possible that the crew um, swam to shore. But in this Buddhist Jataka that I showed at the start, the but uh, he treads water for about three or four days before eventually a goddess notices that, oh my God, the Buddha, or the future Buddha is, is, is like floating in the ocean. I better go down and save him. So she, she comes down and she scoops him up and she brings him back to land. So I think it's uh, not everybody uh, passes away in shipwrecks. Thank you. Uh, okay. Questions? Okay. I can't, oh, I can see now. Anybody got qu any questions? The mic, they have a mic. There's a, over there. You had that earlier exhibit a few years ago about Vietnam. And, the, and all the trading that Vietnam went mm -hmm. to. So this actually sort of ties in with a lot of exhibits you've had, the, the Vietnam with, the, with all the trading, and then the one that was in northern India with all the Greek influence and, mm -hmm. and the interchange of all of these uh, cultures that we really don't tend to uh, think about. 
And so it's sort of consistent in the exhibits that I've seen here. Yeah, that's a, it's a very good point. Um, I think we have known about the, the overland routes um, and the, the sort of the importance of the Silk Route. I think that was maybe Adriana's uh, exhibition. Um, and uh, yeah, and again, the, the trade between the, the, the shipwreck that was found in Vietnam is very interesting because it's a Southeast Asian shipwreck, but it was full of Chinese ceramics. So again, the trade is also sectorial. You have, you know, some of the trade would definitely just be between Southeast Asia and China. Um, and so, it, you know, it's more evidence to talk to that. And yeah, I, I mean, this is, I think, what's, what's really... People, I think, knew that this trade was probably there, but this is really some quite solid. It's more than, I think, what people ever imagined the evidence would be for it. So yeah, I think this is the importance of this collection is that, you know, we, we tend to sometimes think of societies or cultures in isolation, but actually, you know, the, the high points of most cultures is when they're interacting and and trading with each other, and, and ideas are going back and forth. So yeah, I hope that that came out, came through tonight. Yeah, sure. I'll ask another question. No, no, hold on. He's got. A, I think he's got a question. Yeah. About navigation. Uh huh. Was there any science? at that early point? Ah, okay. The question, if you didn't hear, was about navigation. Yeah, I, I think um, I'm, I'm, they definitely would not have um, spent a lot of time at open sea. They would have hugged the coastlines as much as possible because, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure when the Arabs, for example, began to be able to read um, longitude. Um, uh, but they, there is certain segments, like the Bay of Bengal, where they could have gone um, on the open ocean if they caught the monsoon at the right period. So they knew, they, they knew well the periods of the monsoon and when, when, to t you know, when, they, when they could sail and when they could not, because if you went against the monsoon, it was practically impossible and you most likely would sink. Um, but yeah, I, it's a, I'm not quite sure as to when that technology of... Um, uh, I think even up until the 14th, 15th centuries, they were still pretty much hu hugging the coastlines. Yeah. All right, I think we better. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, thank you, uh, Stephen, thank for you. a great lecture. And thank you, everybody, for coming to tonight's lecture. Have a good evening. <laughs>